Person in Person is brought to you by the Perineum Group, the only truly centrist news organization. That's right, Greg. We're in the sweet spot between partisan extremes. When taint the left and taint the right, it's Perineum. What does documentary filmmaker Adam Curtis have to do with the epidemic of needing to poop when you visit a bookstore? Panda Express. When you're here, you're family. Manson family, that is. In Australia, you gotta watch out for the stinger. I love HEMA. You might even say I'm a hemophiliac. My, how the turn tables. All these stories plus emotional weather and stayed up That's tonight on Person in Person. Good evening, wherever you are, whoever you are, and welcome to Season 2 of Person in Person. I'm Gene Person. And I'm Greg Person. No relation. Person in Person is a news show for people who don't like news shows by people who don't like news shows. That hasn't changed. But we do have some uh, some new material. We've actually even taken this time off to invent a whole new style of journalism. That's right, Greg. Just to, uh, do you want me to give them a brief overview of what we've created here, Gene? Yeah, why not? Let's, let's, uh, let's spell it all out for them. Okay, kids. So you know what regular reportage is about. You're just saying, this thing happened today, right? Anybody can do it. A monkey can do it. A computer can do it. Then you have investigative journalism where you say, okay, this thing happened, but let's dive a little deeper and figure out why it happened, who else was involved, what it all means. And that's fine. But again, anybody can do that, but you're just doing it with regular facts, facts that already exist in the world. But what we've done We've created the field of speculative journalism. That's right. We take the stories that did happen, and then we talk about what might have happened. Right. We, we, we dig deep and we figure it out for your benefit. Exactly. I'm not saying that the stuff that we come up with is 100% going to be true, but it is. And also it sounds good, which is the most important thing. Before we dive into the speculative journalism, however, let's get the story beats out of the way. Despite Texas Governor Greg Abbott's startling revelation that masks will no longer be required in the state, the city of Austin has announced that masks will still be required in city limits. Hey, Austin, I see you. You're doing the right thing. The smart thing. The sane thing. What the hell are you doing in Texas? Mega church pastor Robert Jeffers wants people to know that they will have jobs in heaven, just like on earth, only better because there will be no government regulations. I've never been happier that I'm going to hell. Here in Oregon, we have a unique new homegrown variant of COVID-19 proving the microbrew model can be applied to just about anything. I've heard that our COVID is much hoppier than regular COVID. Yeah, it's got that nice bitter note to it. It's good. Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen have started a podcast called Renegades, where they, two of the richest and most famous men in the world, talk about what brave outsiders they are, leading to the conclusion that I'm actually already in hell. Congress has finally passed a $1.9 trillion stimulus deal, a rapid departure from their favored pastime of looking good while doing very little after seven Democratic senators this week torpedoed the $15 minimum wage provision. This comes out as news circulates that the president, Joe Fingerbiter Biden, is against eliminating the filibuster. No word yet on what other plans Democrats have to aggressively deliver the D to the American people. In fairness to Joe, he thought that finger was a Black Lives Matter protester. (laughs) Another pastor, Stuart Allen Clark of Missouri, upbraided women for letting themselves go and not trying harder to look like the, quote, epic, epic trophy wife of all time. Melania Trump. Judging by Mr. Clark himself, the ideal husband looks like a giant pile of wet laundry. Hmm. Sexy. But enough about the news. It's main news. 
so our top story, and now we're getting right into the speculative journalism, is a combination of two articles that we have read, and we will try to bridge the gap between them. I'll go ahead and lead off here, Greg, if that's okay. Oh, by all means. So this is a real phenomenon, and I read an article about it this week, and I was just fascinated. Apparently, if you go into a bookstore, you have a better than average chance of needing to poop. This is a real thing. They even have a name for it. In Japan, it's known as the Mariko Aoki phenomenon. And, uh, you know, there's been lots of theories as to why it happens, why when you enter this this quiet space filled with books, you might need to poop. Some have theorized that it's it's kind of like aromatherapy, the smell of ink and paper acts as a natural laxative, I I think that might be a stretch. Some say that it's a psychological phenomenon, that you're so tense, but then you enter this calming space and suddenly your body's relaxed and is ready to get rid of waste. That sounds reasonable to me. It does, but I want to throw some mirepoix into this soup and uh, see if we can't come up with a synthesis. Now, Gene, are you familiar with the works of uh, the documentarian Adam Curtis? I'm, I might be familiar with some of his works. I'm not familiar with him. What What are some of the films he's done? Um, his biggest ones are probably um, Century of the Self, um, Hypernormalization, which came out in 2016. And he's got a new uh, documentary series, which is basically like six documentaries stitched together that he did for the BBC called... Um, can't get you out of my head and that just dropped like two weeks ago i have seen none of that so well the thing about his films and the basic themes of all of them uh if i can boil it down to a sentence is the conflict between individual humans and their desire for liberty and autonomy versus the bureaucratic machinery that has grown to manage and control them. Hmm. But in order to convey these themes, he's bringing in everything. If you ever want to know what Tupac Shakur has in common with the Bader-Meinhof group, he's got you. If you want to know what the X-Files and Google have to do with the Reverend Sum Young Moon, he's got you. And he'll present these vignettes of these different things that are happening in the 20th and 21st century that all kind of reflect back on these central themes and it's rapid fire. And so what I think this is having in common with bookstores is information overload. Oh, so you think you walk in and you just passively absorb information and it makes you need to poop. Right. What what I think is happening, and I'm going to get a little sciency on you if you'll forgive me, is the expectation of having to absorb all this information. You see all this all this text and you're like, oh man, look at all these books. Your brain, it, it's stimulating your brain. Blood is flowing to your brain, increasing cranial pressure, which is in- increasing the pressure of your spinal fluid, which is putting pressure on your sacral nerves, which is causing your bowels to begin to release. Wow, you went into some tremendous detail there. So you, it, it's really more the anxiety of seeing all the information? I mean, it could just be the anxiety of, of yeah, the potential information overload. Oh, right, potential information. That's a good term. We should fixate on that. So, you know, is this phenomenon common in libraries? Because I would, I would assume that... If, if it were the information contained in the books, it would happen there too. Yeah, I mean, and I assume that it does because every time I go into a bathroom at a library, you can tell that that thing's been in heavy rotation. Hmm. Hmm. Or maybe just not cleaned as often. I, I wonder if, you know, I, I boot up the old Compi 386 here and, and fire up the internet and log into Wikipedia Am I going to shit myself? Hmm. Well, there's only one way to know. All right, let's uh, let's try it. No poops right now. Okay. Well, we're gonna keep checking back in on that periodically, 
Maybe you need to start clicking on some links. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, really? a, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll click on a couple of links here. Greg, if you'll excuse me for a moment. Yep, yep. See, I knew it. I knew it. You start going down some rabbit holes, your brain starts to get full, so your bowels got to get empty. I guess that's just the way it goes. So uh, so I think we've nailed it. We've uh, we've closed in on the, the factor here. It's all information overload. Is, uh, is there someone directly responsible for how this phenomenon affects human beings? Like the Riddler? No, like, uh, like, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, some, some con- conspiracy related content in oh, this documentary's oh, you mean like, work. So I'm wondering if there's something nefarious going on. Well, uh, let's see if I were Adam Curtis, I might connect it back to the British colonial colonization of Kenya. Hmm. Um, because that also is part of it. You know, it might be linked to deforestation somewhat too, because you know you gotta you gotta cut down a lot of trees to make all those books. Okay, you know what I think we were we were missing here in the equation with the bookstores. What are books made out of? Fiber. Fiber. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you think you think you just walk in, your body's a magnet for fiber, and all this all this fiber in the oh, you breathe it in. Yeah. Yeah, I you mean, know, fine you f- th- fiber poly- particles. Oh, this is brilliant. You're getting book particles in your body. It's causing your 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 colon to bulk up. Yeah, so so basically forget that bran muffin and that those couple of cups of coffee. You need to breathe in some books if you're right. all blocked See, up. And and so many people read in the bathroom. They didn't even know why they were doing it, but I think we know now. That's one of the other theories that was floated in the article I read is that people are so used to reading in the bathroom that when they walk into a bookstore, they just associate books with pooping. I thought that was pretty comical. Now, you said the theory was floated. Were you doing a pun there? Yeah. Yeah, that was an intentional pun. Okay, good. Good. Because I do want to let our audience know that um, we have expanded pun jail. Uh, it's a much bigger facility now so that we can both fit inside it at once. Yeah. And uh, the punishments are much harsher in there. The punishments are much harsher. Yes. Yeah. So that's why we're both going in there now. Okay. Well, I think we've cracked it or crapped it as it were. Let's move on to uh, breaking news. Our first breaking story, the deadliest animal in Australia has been announced, and it probably isn't what you expected. Australia is home to some of the world's most dangerous and venomous creatures, including snakes, spiders, crocs, sharks, and of course, Kangaroo Jack the Ripper. But according to the data, there's an animal even deadlier than all of these. Bees. In Australia, 12 people die on average from bee stings every year. Compare that to the seven who die annually from snake bites. Now, bees have a relatively mild venom in addition to having just the very best knees. But allergies can develop suddenly and, of course, can lead to anaphylaxis quickly. Now, of course, it isn't actually the bee venom killing people here. It's their own immune systems. Not meaning to blame the victims here. I'm just saying. That's how this all works. And I'll... I'll add that human beings are far more dangerous to bees than bees are to us. Well, if they didn't want to, uh, if they didn't want to go extinct, they shouldn't have started a fight. That's all I can say. Still, Jesus Christ, Greg. Still, this was a honey of a story. I had to comb through several to find one I wanted to tell. Oh, that, that is a good one. That's got me buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're both going to pun jail so hard. And you know what? We'll deserve it. But we'll make the best of it. It'll be like Midnight Express. Just as long as it's not like the Shawshank Redemption. Oh, where we have to climb through the poop? Yeah, because I don't... I mean, I, I just don't have enough books to make it happen. I don't. <laughs> we've we've uh, we've really gotten in the weeds with this book poop thing. I, you know, I think this may be an ongoing theme. We'll just see how that plays out. What's your uh, what's your breaking story, Greg? Panda Express employees in Southern California were required to attend seminars in which they were subjected to isolation and abuse and forced to strip naked in trust exercises 
as a condition for promotion with the chain. Uh, the uh, company that conducted the seminars is called Alive Seminars and Coaching, which is a name that's worrisome in the same way as a store called Alive Pets or an orphanage called Alive Kids. Holy cow. So they were conducting team exercises and forcing these people to like strip naked and stuff? Yeah, like to strip naked and uh, confess their deepest fears to the group. And then the group would, you know, support them and hug them while everybody's in their underwear. Like they're not buck naked, but they're way more naked than you should be with a coworker. See, I didn't even realize that Panda Express was a fraternity. Oh, well, you know, uh, that's why when you've you've finished your meal, it's part of their sort of secret menu. If you go up to them and you say, thank you, sir, may I have another? You can actually get another order to go. Oh, fan- fantastic. I didn't know that. That's great. That's like the secret menu at uh, In-N-Out. Yes, except uh, In-N-Out is not going to waterboard you or, you know, try to terrorize you psychologically. And that's why I don't eat there anymore. You miss that. You miss that personal touch. <laughs> well, at this at this Panda Express seminar, apparently it got so out of control that several people were vomiting, which is, again, maybe that's part of the frat party connection, but it's not the vibe that you want for a management seminar, I would say. Yeah, probably not. But, um, you know, coincidentally, though, this has not slowed Panda Express down at all. They've just announced the opening of uh, three new locations at the Spawn Ranch, Jonestown, and Salt Lake City. I see what you did there. Yeah, it's good stuff. Greetings, gentle listeners. If you enjoy this podcast, you may also like Brosé, a mirthy talk show starring four bros who sip wine and consider questions submitted by you, the audience, about current events, pop culture, and which Muppet you should get tattooed on your back. Subscribe to Brosé wherever you get your podcasts. That's B. R-O-S-E. Brose, the podcast for those who drink rose. All right. Well, folks, it's sports. All right, kids. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about sports this week, specifically HEMA, which stands for Historic European Martial Arts. Now, this is not LARPing, uh, and it's not even like fencing which is kind of a a formalized combat adjacent sport. Uh, These are people who are making an earnest effort to reconstruct and preserve the traditional fighting styles of the knights of old, you know, medieval and Renaissance Western European stuff with armor and long swords and all this kind of thing. Now I've watched a bit of this on YouTube now. Uh, Specifically, I watched uh, several matches in the, uh, long sword championships. Long sword is apparently the premier event in HEMA. Hmm. And while I'm sure that these guys are serious athletes and that this is a worthy pursuit, it's also dorky as hell and kind of unwatchable. So sort of the hockey of the 14th century. Oh, I hate you so much. I know. I know you're a hockey man. I don't get it. I, I, yeah. Can't follow what's going on, and I wouldn't care if I could. Yeah, I'd so much rather watch a sport like, you know, baseball or football where nothing happens over the course of several hours than than watch a sport where something happens every two seconds. You know? See, maybe that's the problem with hockey, because I try to follow it. I can't even tell where the puck is most of the time. And when I when I have isolated the puck, it's gone again. And I'm like, okay... Maybe this sport is just a little too fast paced for me, but I'm not tracking any of this. It's information overload. It makes me want to (laughs) poop. Now, but speaking of HEMA, though, even though I don't particularly enjoy watching the sport, I am glad it exists because it's keeping these young men off of 4chan, which looking at them is definitely where they would be if they weren't busy with longsword practice. I think it's interesting that uh that in in Great Britain this is considered a sport whereas you know in the south it's just national pride or whatever they call it when they reenact the civil war and their uh their deep appreciation for racism and slavery and all that 
Well, you know, in um, in England, they also have Civil War reenactors, uh, Roundheads and Cavaliers. Mm. So it's Civil War reenactment. That is, we actually might get into that on a future sports segment now that I think about it, because that is okay. weird. And I would like yeah. to dwell on it a little bit. Yeah, it's a whole subculture, an interesting subculture, very nerdy. And, and definitely, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with, with the comparison to LARPing. Um, it's a whole thing. See, whereas this, I would say that this is not like reenactment because they're not pretending that they're like specific knights at specific battles. I see. They're just, they're saying we are going to, we're going to fight in the same style with the same weapons. And they've actually, you know, they've gone back and looked at medieval combat manuals and and different schools that existed at that time because there was a, a full-fledged martial arts tradition in Western Europe at that time. And then when they all started using guns, they kind of forgot about it. And these people have, have rediscovered it and are trying to revive it. Where are my dragons? Well, sometimes if you don't see dragons, you've got to imagine dragons. <laughs> On to the emotional weather. Folks, we've kept the emotional weather segment the same. This this week, our emotions are easy, breezy, and lemon squeezy. My story for easy, a mom named Dana Simmons observed that an online test her son had taken returned only a 50% score, and that the results had returned too fast for the teacher to have graded the test themselves. After a cursory examination of the results, she observed that the test was being graded by an AI algorithm. She challenged her son to find a way to game the system. And boy, did he come through. His solution was to write two brief sentences on the subject, followed by a word salad of related keywords. The result? He was able to pass any short answer quiz with a perfect score. The company that makes the test, Edgenuity, is in frequent use during the pandemic, and of course, short answers aren't the only quizzes that it offers. But still, this kid proved that if nothing else, he's smart enough to engineer a solution to a problem, and I applaud him. If, if teachers don't want to do their jobs, then neither should students. And if this kid figured out how to beat the computer, good on him. Well, I, I, I want to be clear here that I don't think it's the teacher not doing their job. In a lot of cases, the reasons why the teachers have to use this substandard software is the administration. But, Fair enough. But Fair yeah. enough. Well, speaking of test, Gene, researchers at Rutgers have developed a COVID test that screens for all three variants and delivers results in just over an hour with a method that's also cheaper and easier than the current methods. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, it's going to help a lot of people because since they don't want to burn for eternity with the pharmaceutical executives, they've refused to patent the test and made the instructions for how to implement it yourself publicly available so that uh, doctors and clinicians in other places can use it as well. Open source medicine. Wow. Yeah, what a concept, right? Like this is what happens when you give a problem to human beings to solve instead of giving it to literal demons in skin suits. That is great. That's fantastic. Yeah, good luck to those guys. I am sure that cuz this literally just happened. So, they're going to be getting a lot more of these in the future and I think it's going to be a real game changer for folks. Yeah, and I think that the karmic payoff for them is going to be huge. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody remembers Jonas Salk because not only did he create the polio vaccine, he also refused to patent it. Jonas who? Yep. See what you did there. <laughs> I'm not amused. My breezy story. In West Java, Indonesia, a woman is claiming that when she was hit with a gust of wind, she became pregnant. Soon after, she gave birth to a baby girl. Now, some suspect that this is not, in fact immaculate conception and that the woman is trying to cover up having a child out of wedlock that may be the case but interestingly this was not the woman's first child she'd had a baby with her ex-husband with whom she'd split four months previous 
The phenomenon of a woman not knowing she's pregnant until very late is a common one, incidentally. I want to add that it is possible that prior to little Jean's conception, Gil may have been hit by some wind as well. I was eating a lot of Chipotle back in that day. So you're saying that little Jean is made of a fart? I'm saying he's... I don't know that he's not made of a fart. I mean, there's a test for that now. They've developed it at Rutgers. Well, excuse me. (laughs) So my breezy story... The U.S. is beginning the process of building its first major offshore wind farm off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. Um, they've you know, just started doing the environmental survey for it. It's estimated that the project will generate enough renewable electricity for more than 400,000 homes and businesses in Massachusetts and eliminate 1.68 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, good job for us. It's only literally 30 years after the first major offshore wind farm in Europe, uh, which was done by Denmark. Well, you know, it's not a race against something that's going to kill us all or anything. So what's the It literally is a race, and uh, (laughs) we've we've already lost. Yeah, yeah. So we're all going to die. Speaking of... Climate change, my lemon squeezy story, unfortunately, in the wake of the human tragedy that came from a winter storm that hit Texas, the prices of citrus fruits are likely to skyrocket. As the Texas citrus industry suffered somewhere around $230 million in losses. Fortunately, orange prices will remain largely unchanged because uh, Florida and California, they got us covered. Grapefruit and lemon, however, may see some increases. If you don't want to pay more for your citrus fruits, there is a fix, though. Do something about climate change. Oh, you mean like uh, carbon credits, cap and trade? (laughs) No, I mean mean something substantial that actually uh, does more than just incentivize bad actors to game the system. I mean, if you say so. But here's what I think. I think we should call Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd and have them do a Trading Places sequel. That, if you'll also remember, also hinged on the prices of citrus fruit. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah, I was I was struggling to see where you were going there. Yeah, the price of uh, orange commodities. That's right. Yep, and, you know, Eddie Murphy just had a big hit with the sequel to Coming to America. So why not get Dan Aykroyd back in blackface? Why not? Let's do it. I know that's your favorite scene in that movie. They probably aren't going to do it again. Yeah, yeah. But they well, might. I think. They might. Well, and hopefully they don't bring back uh, Al Franken. Well, <laughs> I mean, he didn't have a huge role in the first movie, so I don't think he necessarily needs to come back. Yeah, too bad they can't bring but, back Denholm Elliott. Well, I was just going to say, do you think they'll be able to bring back the guy who played Coleman? Probably not without, like, uh, a Ouija board. <laughs> right. Or some Microsoft software. Maybe they can do a hologram like they did for Tupac. That'd be pretty sweet. That would rule. What's your uh, lemon squeezy story? Well, going back to my general theme of the day, the fact that this is actually hell, uh, seven-year-old Liza Scott of Alabama needs immediate brain surgery, so she's selling lemonade to help pay for the procedure because when a little child needs their brain fixed, Somebody's going to pony up $75,000, which is what the procedure costs. Oh, my God. Well, but here's the good news. There's actually good news on this one, Gene. Because of the media attention that they got for the story about a a little child having to sell lemonade to pay for brain surgery, her family got a huge surge of donations on their online fundraiser. They blew their goal out of the water several times over. So she'll be able to get this surgery and any other care she needs and like a really nice boat after that or whatever else. Yeah, she wants. That's great and all for her, but like, it just makes me think of all the other people that this, this sick and twisted healthcare system we have screws over and how many people aren't able to see that surge in donations, you know, I agree, but you know, it's, it's like that old adage goes when life gives you brain problems, sell lemonade. Wow. Make, making a joke about a little kid needing brain surgery. All right. I'm a sick man. I'm a spiteful man. 
As you know, every week our investigative team covers a detailed and harrowing story on food crime. This week, Greg Person has the story. Folks, I want to tell you about a classic Italian food crime that has gone unpunished for far too long. I'm talking about biscotti. Because, listen, there is room in this world for both crunchy and chewy cookies, and I love to crunch. Crunch is my favorite texture and my favorite activity, but there's crunchy and there's construction material, mm. and biscotti goes too far. Yeah, I mean, you want to make some biscotti, you just make some cookie dough and you bake those cookies and then uh, and then let them sit around for two weeks, and it's perfect. If you find that you can bite it without breaking a tooth, put it back in the oven. Right, right. And I can hear you folks out there in podcast land saying, but Greg, why not just dip the biscotti in your drink until you can chew it? Well, first of all, fuck you. Second of all, <laughs> it's because if a food isn't edible, I'm not going to eat it. It's pretty simple. I can boil a shoe until it's soft enough for me to chew it. But that doesn't make it food. You're here. I hate biscotti, and I completely agree with you. We are on the same page, Greg. Excellent, because I was fully prepared to fire myself from this podcast if you gave me any pushback. No pushback from me. Maybe from the listeners. What say you, noble listeners? Do you think that uh, do you think that biscotti qualifies as food crime? They're not saying anything, so, so so they must agree with us. Silence is consent. You heard it here from Gene Person. What the hell? <laughs> Gene Person said it on a microphone and believes it 100% in all cases. All right, on to the podcast shopping network. Now, I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten into or out of a car without hurting yourself? Of course not. It's a problem that has plagued us since Henry Ford went all mass production on the motor car. Luckily, all that twisting and contorting you have to do doesn't mean a visit to the ER. Not with Tush Turner. A round pillow that turns on a base and allows you to swivel from a front-facing position to a side-facing position without grievous injury. The Tush Turner is, no lie... One of the dumbest things I have ever seen. I don't know who needs a Lazy Susan for their ass. I don't know who bought this thing. I don't even understand how anyone thought this would have mass appeal or sell well. Like, I understand there's a market for this product. People with injuries or conditions that make it difficult to get in or out of the car. But that's not how this was pitched. It was offered as a solution to the most common problem. Turning your body from one direction to another while sitting down. The Tush Turner retailed for $19.99 plus $6.99 shipping and handling. $27 to turn your butt 90 degrees. Gene, uh, fun fact. Did you know that Tush Turner is one of my favorite adult film stars? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I loved, uh, I loved uh, What's Love Got to Do With It. It was a great song. <laughs> oh, man, we're going to get sued by Tita Turner. That sucks. <laughs> but you know what? It was worth no, it. No, we get sued by Tush Turner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that seem like that should be a ZZ Top song? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a ZZ Top song for sure. But actually, I want to uh, uh, go deeper on the Tush Turner sure. because it's one of my favorite categories of infomercial products, which is assistive devices for old people who need help but refuse to admit that that's what it's for. Yeah, like uh, like boomer boomer ego aids. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. It's like the the one that is a super spy listening device that's actually just a, a badly designed hearing right, aid. Right. But or or the they uh, can't magnifying sell it glass as a with the aid. light on it. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly the kind of stuff you're talking about. Right. It's not your fault that you can't read menus in restaurants anymore. Restaurants are so dark these days. Just get a, a, a magnifying glass with a light on it. You'll be fine. Right. It's not senescence. You just need to be a spy. <laughs> right. You, you've got your Dick Tracy listening device and your magnifying glass. Nobody knows you need glasses and a hearing aid. Exactly. Now get back to reposting those Facebook memes. 
I mean, how are people going to know what Obama's up to these days? What are they going to do? Watch his Netflix special? (laughs) Not likely. All right. On to uh, State Up. We've changed the State Up segment slightly. Now it's just going to be facts about the state. And by facts, you know, there's quotation marks around that. But still, this week, our State Up segment is featuring Arkansas. In Arkansas, it's a felony to mispronounce the state name. So remember, it rhymes with Santa Claus. (laughs) Arkansas was first discovered when a pirate settler thought that the unimproved wilderness they'd settled in was Kansas. Arkansas has produced more Clintons than any other state. Arkansas is the only state in the Union where it's illegal to use the letter W. Arkansas also produces more rice than any other state, but it's illegal to eat it. Little Rock, Arkansas is well known, but did you know there's a a town in Arkansas named Big Rock? This one's actually true. Big Rock is much, much smaller than Little Rock, ironically. That is news I cannot possibly (laughs) use. Our final segment tonight, as every week, is Person to Person and Person, where we share your valuable feedback with our audience. First off, a big shout out to our listener, Tim, who became the first person we didn't know to email us in response to our actual show. As a result... I move to cancel the results of our previous online polls. All listeners will now be known as Tim's. I love it. You know, there are those who call me Tim. I did not know that, Greg. No, that's that's not true. I made that up. I'm sorry. Tim, we promised you a haiku and a limerick on the subject of your choice. And uh, we've decided that each of us would write you uh, one of each poem. Mine are on the subject of your choice. Uh, Greg has gone a different direction, but that's fine. Tim has chosen, much to my chagrin, fortune-telling for the subject, but I still believe I have delivered. So, Tim, my haiku for you. A crystal ball shines. A, quote, therapist, end quote, sees the color green. And my limerick, there once was a psychic from Darrow who made a good living at tarot. She was mostly a thief, but her readings were cheap. In the last line, I've used the word marrow. Ooh, fancy. (laughs) Tim, I went in a slightly different direction, as Jean said. I wrote my poems all about you, in celebration of you, because you are our best fan, our only true fan, and you are the one that uh, we will both marry uh, when the time is right. You know, Gil is going to probably be okay with that. I mean, she knew when we started a podcast that it was going to involve a group marriage and all of us moving to a a compound in uh, rural eastern Oregon, right? Yeah, just in time for the uh, Panda Express trainings. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I did book us all uh, a room at the Marriott with the Alive Seminars people. So hopefully... Um, We'll all make it out of that relatively unscathed. We'll certainly make it out relatively unclothed. (laughs) Yes, that is not in dispute. Okay, so first I want to read my limerick, or timerick, if you will. (laughs) There once was a hero named Tim, who was bursting with vigor and vim. He accomplished his goal of getting so swole, he was too big to fit in the gym. All right. And I wrote a beautiful haiku for you, Tim. Every drop of rain which waters the earth is Tim. The Earth is also Tim. Yeah, that's, uh, that's nice. It is, as the kids say, very zen. Folks, that's all the show we have for you tonight. Do you want to be cool like Tim and have a haiku written about the subject of your choice? We might just make this a regular segment. Send us an email, show at gmail.com. Drop us a voicemail, 541-249-5933. And until next time... This is Gene Person saying you should always end a comedy set with a callback. And this is Greg Person saying, I love a crunch. Good night.
Okay, hear me out. I'm just going to try this real quick. Do you need to poop? <laughs>